together because this is a five string banjo and uh and all of you can watch it now all of you can remember this first step where you were take it and make that and it'll uh, sound that on your brain cell and after you want to get it sounded on your brain cell you'll love to remember it for 10 years when you hear it you know every time you get them all and, playing uh, yeah. Now, you want to try a little shot there now? I can try it. I don't know if I can play like you right yeah. away. You'll have to. Well, you see, you just be patient. Bang, really tall. Wait just a minute till I let them get this step one. Now, go ahead now. We'll come with you. Wait, okay, we'll see if I do it real quick. That's it? That's it. I got it. Of course, I can't do much else with it yet. That old man could work circles around us. Uh, just would, would he like? What was it? Would he uh, like get up early or something or what? How no, it had to do at night or economy of movement. Okay. No. He had work, well, You got to look at it from his point of view. You know, he had so many different professions through the years. I mean, he was a TV repairman and a bicycle repairman and a locksmith, and he had all of this knowledge, you know? Right, right. And so he was a man who was so accustomed to working with his hands and in unison with his mind. always able to work around us like a little tornado just is running around to all of us and doing everything at an incredible rate. <laughs> I, mean, I, just, I hope now, as an old man that I have that energy. I would love to think that I could, uh, could carry on. So Howard was 65 when I met him. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> His body might have been 65, but uh, he was, wow. he was ricocheting. Oh, wow. this is so wonderful. I haven't even looked at it in a long, long time. He would write in the little stuff, because he would say you must always read between the lines. And he would do text. I mean, well, I'll tell you what he told me how he got started as an artist, but I, I you know, it's hard to say. Um, he says that he got started as an artist because his head got so full of stuff it was about to explode, and he knew that he had to get, let it out. Like a, I think he even used some analogy like a valve or something. He had to just get it out of his head. And uh, but as far as how he got started as an artist, he just started making stuff, and. Um, and word spreads when you make stuff, especially like what he made. And uh, so it wasn't any time at all before the uh, artist in Georgia, uh, especially uh, Georgia artists, began to embrace him. And, and which is a wonderful thing for him because it, 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 you could 
you know, he was uh, not uh, just considered to be this eccentric uh, minister uh, anymore, but he actually uh, had found his people or his, his audience or whatever. He had fi uh, finally found people who understood that, that uh, the co uh, creative impulse. I'm sure that, that was a big deal. I mean, look here. Here's the first page of his of his self-published book, and he talks about how the, you know there's this artist named Andy Nassis, who's a, a very very highly regarded American clay artist uh, who has you know become friends with Howard, and and so Howard felt that that was so important, you know, that he would put this in the in the book. I mean, it must have been a marvelous thing for him, having been an eccentric all of his life, to finally. You know, to, like I said, find his people. I mean, I'm sure that that meant a great deal to him. He loved artists. He was crazy about artists. And every time, I mean, I would, one summer when I was up there, Andy Warhol called him. You know, and when he got off the phone, he acted just completely casual. Like, this fellow named Andy Warhol called me, and, and we talked early today. And, and I was just, you know, dying a million deaths because I knew who Andy Warhol was. He also had told me that he had talked on the phone with some guy named David Bryan who had a wrote him a check to make him some artwork for his album cover and it was David Byrne of the Talking Heads you know and and, <laughs> and he and I said no no and I was like so like uh, uh, non-believing and Howard said here and reached in his pocket and he's, he had had the check he'd been holding on to it for a while and he's sure as hell he had a check <laughs> it's crazy <laughs> he just I love how he just you know uh, t took the the big, the impressive stuff that we're all impressed with, and for to Howard, it was just uh, this man called me some Smithsonian man or whatever. <laughs> you know? I uh, would be a nervous wreck, but he he just treated everybody the same. But it was in the early '80s, and which was a very heady time to be up there because, like you know, there was the connection with uh, the Talking Heads and REM and all these. I mean, Howard was exploding in in the art world during that time. I mean, he was receiving phone calls, you know, from people all over the world, and and he was always fascinated by that. He'd go, "You're not gonna believe this, but somebody from Argentina called me today." And you know. <laughs> Did he do a lot of world traveling? I don't know if Howard ever went anywhere. He kind of didn't have to go anywhere because he, you know, had been off, uh, you know, in outer space for 200 years and had spawned generations uh, up there, and which he talked about a lot back then. I, I don't know if in the latter years of his life if he talked that much about it, but, you know, this, that's what this book is. This book is... Uh, vision of 200 light years away space born of three generations from earth to heaven of heavens you know I mean he swears by it I'd been there for, for, for a very short time and uh, we'd worked real hard one day and we were late he had bought a trampoline for his grandkids and we, and I went and laid down on the trampoline he came out there and laid down and, and it, it turned dark and the stars were appearing in the sky and he pointed up to this star and he said That's where I come from. And I thought originally that what he was saying is uh, him being a, a Christian or whatever, that maybe that he was saying that heaven was there or whatever. And then he starts telling me that he had been abducted. Or, or it sounded like an abduction, that he had been taken up and had spent 200 years in space and then instantly zapped back down to earth and no time had passed and we read about these alien abductions and it sounds to me like it very much parallels that but yeah he, he wrote this book um, and uh, put it together while I was up there and gave me this copy of it and it was it's a, a crazy wonderful little thing it uh, I don't think it could be simply written off as a product of an overly uh, active imagination um, what appealed to me the most about it is having grown up in Alabama and uh, you know, had a lot of, uh, of uh, organized religion shoved down my throat, uh, I'd never um, thought about the possibility that somebody could take uh, you know, Christianity and then tie it in with all kinds of space alien stuff and, and, and sort of have this um, 
incredibly rich belief system, and 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 uh, and he definitely had that. It was, and it, there was also besides that, there was his his life to some extent was sort of had a. a a, a, a druidic quality because he definitely had a lot of uh, uh, as a lot of uh, people who were raised in the country do a lot of nature worship and he um, uh, he also had a, a, almost a, a zen uh, eastern quality to a lot of the stuff that he did and said he definitely um, could uh, really freak you out with a lot of his uh, uh, taking country expressions but uh, uh, having them operate on a level of being almost like some kind of Zen metaphor for life. And he used to use those a lot, especially when on his grandsons, he was uh, all the time amazing them with uh, strange little situations that he would present to them to where they were forced to um, think about the spiritual implications of a simple day-to-day -day activity. That's why you see the plaques of the scripture and the word of God put up everywhere within it. Howard wanted his work as people's curiosity grew and he began to sell pieces out of the garden. He wanted his work to have a voice. I feel like it's ready. a miracle. I mean, we didn't know anything about him. We just came mm -hmm. down here and met him, and he put us to work for God and changed our whole life. He's changed you know? a lot of lives. You know? I mean, God did it, but he brought Howard was special in bringing those people together. You know, because you know, we were talking about how everybody looked to Howard for guidance, and now you know, here, look what's going on in the world. Like now he's gone. You know, and everybody's, you know. Everybody's realizing it's like, hey, it's up to all of us now. Yeah. I think there's definitely a torch that's being passed at this moment in time. The people that are like the old timers out here that are like saying, I'm getting ready to go on to the next world. And you know, you know, it's up to you, you know, to like, to keep it going. You know, I've had several people actually say this you know it's like they put it in your hands like you or you know with keep young people to like you know keep putting it out there Yeah. 
Got his banjo or anything with you? Let me get your arm out from around this, Papa. Hey, you want to buy it? I used to find if I get a hold of it. I'm going to go here somewhere. Probably down there. Hey, Jack. 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 Hey, Jack.
with old age and can't hardly get around. And my wife don't even know how to tie my tie. <laughs> well, you know that old age is going to come to all of us. We live long enough. You yeah. got two choices. <laughs> yeah, but you'll be able to get somebody to tie your tie. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Anybody know how to tie a tie? Well, yeah. Is That's that something? Is there anything else you'll please tell me? Uh, this is good enough. Oh, you're a hero, brother. Maybe the last time I get to tell you. No. It's pretty important. All I got to tell you. Pretty Always work with Yeah, he's going to tell us something. Well, I've been here about 83 years. I've known a lot of good preachers in this world. I've listened to just about every one of them. It's on the radio. It's on TV. And I listened for their messages. And then I pastored 10 different churches myself and got up and addressed my congregations through 40 years. Dress my congregation with the gospel of Christ. And uh, I was there at the house one day and thinking about, you know, Jesus is going to come pretty soon. I just wondered if everything was all right with me. I, th I thought it was. I feel like that I have uh, done the best I could and preached 10 different churches and got a lot of people saved and married a lot of couples. And then I get to study, but there ain't no telling how many couples I married that was only legitimate. They might not even be man and wife. And I don't know about that. And I've about quit marrying people. But I just don't feel like I'm able to figure that out. They figure it out. These big preachers know. They can figure it out. They know how it is. And whether it's you need to marry again or what. And then I got to study about myself. I'm going to meet God at 12. And I've been listening to all these preachers. And there's something they hadn't told me. They hadn't told me that there wasn't no such thing as famous people. They hadn't told me that. And I bought a set of tapes of Jesus talking. I laid them by my pillar and I started playing the messages of Jesus Christ. He's the one that told me, not the preacher. I'm sorry for the preacher that don't tell everything Jesus tells. And you'll find out that there's a lot you can learn by playing the tapes of Jesus. I can't quote it this exactly, but I'm going to tell you sort of how it was. It made it plain to me. Because I want everything to be all right when Jesus comes. I don't want nothing to be in my way. Nothing. And uh, this uh, Jesus got to talking, and he told them. He said, you all come in here with fine jewelry, like that from Georgia Gold. Man made that for my band, man, band and made my wife one. And this is the one she gave me for life. That's the red ribbon of diamonds. And these people come in with this jewelry and all, and all fixed up and everything, and they'd say to them, y'all go up uh, higher. Go up higher. And they said to the poor when they come in, they didn't tell them where to go. And I can hear the Lord say to them, Y'all go up higher. Now, I believe he said to them, you go down in these lower seats and when they come around to calling you up, you'll be exalted. You'll feel better. And you go down there and then when they call you, you come up to these higher seats. And the Lord was telling me and I couldn't get it off my mind. And Jesus told them people, he said, you all are doing a sin. He says, that's a sin to, to love one person better than another. That's what Jesus taught me. And I wondered why that 59 or 60 pastors across the United States and all the good preachers are in the world, why none of them couldn't tell me that. There's no such thing 
with God <coughs> as a respectful person. He said, if you have respect to a person, to you it is a sin. And I found myself in that category. I found myself in these 14 churches. I went back over them years. And that's time when I was doing about the same thing as all the other preachers were doing. And I was accepting honor that I didn't even deserve that honor belonged to the poor person. Jesus loved him just as good as he loved the richest person on earth. <clears throat> I tell you, when you get through studying Jesus, you're going to find a lot of things. And I'd advise all of you to get you a set of tapes. St. Mark and St. Luke and Matthew and all that. And uh, some by your pillow. And the night when you feel like it, no, turn Jesus on. Listen to him talk. And you'll find out some things that I don't believe you'll find out in these churches. And I, t I pastored 10 churches myself. I pastored Chesterfield. I stayed there for a while. I pastored Chelsea. I stayed there 15 years. I pastored the Bearden Baptist Church. I stayed there for quite a while. And then I pastored at Mill Creek down the valley. Some people had a time down there. And uh, then I run a revival on down in Gadsden up on the mountain. And uh, I run a revival at a uh, little church there. And, and uh, where, where we run that revival. I had several saved there. And I'm just telling you that uh, one main thing I wanted to get over to you is for you to find out a few of the real facts before you go to meet God. Just find out a few of the real facts. Like somebody comes along and says, oh, they're very famous. They drive a limousine and they got a million dollar home. Well, in Jesus' sight, they ain't any more than this poor fellow. Not a bit more. Now, you may not believe that, and it was kind of hard for me to believe, but when Jesus told me to it, told me about it, I did believe him. And that's another thing I want you to do, is when you go to take the notion to believe in anything, believe in Jesus Christ. They stole him out of the tomb and laid it on him, but he didn't even really resurrect it. And since that, there's been a scripture written, in the last days, whosoever shall pray in the name of Jesus shall be saved. Why? Because Jesus is God's Son. Jesus meet me Right, there's the piece that goes over the over the over that top. 
and you know it's a rich cat. But anyway, that's about how wide that piece of metal is. So it's straight through right there. And then, like I said, when you start beating on it, tying it back on itself, it curls in on itself. And it, it's hard to believe that it's out of one straight piece of metal. But it's pretty neat. Well, I climbed on top of a roof to take some roof ridge cap off. Of course, I had the whole roof to do it, you know. But yeah, I'm, I'm getting a lot of this off of old buildings. All the crackheads are going in these old abandoned buildings, and the owners are real eager to get rid of them. Oh. So I jump in there a lot of times, you know. It's free as me. And then I had some people, you know, once you start getting it out and knowing that, that you're doing this kind of stuff, people say, oh, man, I got all this. You know, tin is cheap. Oh. I mean, even recycled tin, you can buy it for like 2 to 3 $4 a sheet. That's for a 16-foot piece, you know. So I can make a lot of stuff out of, out of that material. I mean, man, that's amazing. I mean, it's all old stuff, you know, you see. And some of it, I've, I've tried to do it where I, I would utilize the colors that was on the metal. Wow. And then I start with one little color, and then boom, the next thing I know, the whole thing's painted, you know, and you try to try to keep it. Now, who is that? Well, actually, when I, when I did it, that mouthpiece was awfully like a snake, so I think I'm about making snake. Yeah, Snakeophones instead of saxophones. <laughs> that would be good. Yeah. But I just didn't paint it. I had to paint it that gold, you know. But, you know, I met this little lady and she bought two of my guitar players. Tupelo. Yeah, it's still there. And uh, she's a redhead lady. And actually, when I started painting this thing, I wasn't planning on painting her, but that is her. You know, so as much as I can make a representation of, of somebody. She lives in Tupelo? <laughs> and she didn't have it. She gave me a check, and she didn't put a. a no, twenty-seven-year-old woman bought two big three hundred twenty-five dollars worth of artwork. And I was talking to her dad. She brought her dad with her later on to buy another piece. And I asked her what she did for a living. She sold. She sold drugs, <laughs> but legal drugs like for Procter and Gamble or somebody like that. You know. That's, but for you know somebody that's twenty-seven and bought. Yeah. That's what I think. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway. Really mess you up. But she made a big impression on me because, you know, at 27, I wasn't going around buying artwork, you know. So that, that was pretty neat, you know. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. What do you call that? That's a devil puppet. Red devil lie. Yeah. Nice. Oh yeah, he say whatever you want him to. He mainly says bad stuff, and that one there says good stuff since he's a devil. Is this Bob Ross over here? Yeah. Or is this is Bob Ross three? Yeah. Great artwork, huh? Uh, what would your friend have to pay for that piece of gold? Uh, probably, yeah, ten dollars. Oh, get out of town. Nah, probably uh, around forty or fifty. Howard collaborate with us. Take it. Yeah, Howard. The redwood tree. There's a seller of a isolated place of the redwoods that they're trying to take care of. Yes, sir. And you can go in there and visit all of them. And you can walk across the trunks of some of them, but it don't look possible that you can get that close to a tree that big. And you look right up them and you can see out of sight. You want to sign it for Somebody waiting try to climb one of them or get involved and make a store out of it. Julia Butterfly? Yeah. And then there's one store that was done matured and they made a road through it. And, uh, they still go through that. It's still there. And uh, this, uh, this redwood here is 
one of the the better trees that hasn't lost its grip yet. It could be made a little bit bigger around the trunk. I sure will. Make the limb just a little bit bigger. Okay. And uh, the color, I don't know, if you get up there and look at them things, you might get a real, real color. Okay. And if you can uh, do something on a redwood tree, like one that big girl, out of that forest out there, that would be a good day's work for you. That tree right there is going to be a big one. And if you'll notice right here, there's another tree trunk that can start right here and it comes right down this way. Okay. And it comes right here down this way. Right. And there's a lot of stuff down here around the bottom you can draw out with a little darker stuff than this, something like that black. Okay. Pygmy Warrior, my favorite piece. His head moves. His arm moves. His other arm moves, but that's as far as I go. You're branching out, huh? Yes, I am. It's uh, the more I do, the more I learn, the more I learn, the more I like it. And so there's like really no end to this, as far as I can see this today. I'm going to um, pursue it until it just it just bores me to death, and then I'll find some other aspect of it that enlightens the whole new project. It's happened too many times to think it's over. Inspired by a nail in the foot. There are my fish and chicken crutches. Very strong. These are my chickens, and these are my fish. Cool. Fish and chicken. I'm up with a ball and socket. Actually, I'll show it to you. Yeah, wonderful. This is the ball and socket. I take a ball and wear gloves and make it as round as possible. And I attach it to the hot plastic head. I have to do it all at once, pretty much. But then I stick it, well, I get, get it wet, stick it in another hot piece of plastic like the neck. It's like just an old dragon, an old dragon. Do his head. You want to touch his head? Kind of neat, isn't it? That is. Then it, I, I, uh, all my dragon's heads, arms, move. Mm -hmm. this, uh, this one over here is, uh, has got seashells for the teeth. Oh, and she noticed the magic of the eyes. She loves the eyes. Mm -hmm. What is that? What? Yeah. Flander? Yeah. Snake, I caught the rope. We were talking to a couple of the guys that worked there and they said that it's just... That's not right. It's too heavy. <laughs>